my name is Nathan Rush. I'm a reformed artist. Uh, I've been a developer at Luma for uh, about eight and a half years. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my background, uh, kind of backing into development, uh, give a brief overview of Nuke's TD architecture, give you all a break from those nice visuals that you were just looking at. Um, and then I'm going to kind of try to squeeze in some closing thoughts. Uh, just a heads up, I don't have anything really flashy to show because uh, oftentimes I find that development isn't particularly glamorous to look at and uh, some code just doesn't look good on slideshows. Uh, but I'm going to do my best. So going back to the early years, my first exposure to Nuke uh, was in school in 2004, 2005, around there, back when everybody wanted to work at Pixar. Back then, it was still D2 Nuke, which was Digital Domain's software division. Uh, I don't know how many people here are familiar with that. Um, I took some CS courses in school, C++. They were kind of C++ oriented back then. Um, that was like the foundational path that everybody took to development. And it all kind of went over my head at the time. Uh, I also, while I was in school, joined a forum called VFX Talk. I don't know if anybody here was ever on VFX Talk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that ended nicely. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, I kind of used VFX talk questions that people were asking as an impetus to learn new things uh, my, on my own time to try to answer questions before anybody else could. Um, and I actually ended up getting my first job that way. I kind of just got approached out of the blue, approached on the forum. Uh, I got a job as a, as a generalist working in mostly commercials back in the, the days of the first Android phones. Um, that was most of our bread and butter back then. Uh, I had kind of lots of strong, largely uninformed opinions at the time coming out of that uh, environment. And, uh, but my, my new job uh, involved using Nuke 5 pretty regularly. And for those of you who remember, Nuke 5 was the first version that uh, added Python support. So at a, after a time working there, I decided that I wanted to try and take a crack at using the new Python integration to build myself some tools for my day-to-day -day kind of workflow. So. Uh, Python being such a, a well-integrated or uh, widely used language in the VFX industry was pretty uh, transformational for me uh, because it allowed me to grow my skill set, my, my newly uh, found interest of development while focusing on problems that were relevant to an area that I was already very interested in. Um, as you all know, Python is pretty much the de facto standard for an orchestration language uh, in VFX. Uh, a large part of that is due to the ecosystem for generating bindings to lower level APIs or uh, even dynamically binding C APIs. So even though Python itself is not fast, you can use it to call code that is fast if you need to. Um, it's also very approachable, particularly for someone with no development background. Um, it has what I call a small syntactic surface area. So there's not a lot of wacky symbols that you have to keep track of when you're writing Python. Uh, it reads fairly naturally once you get used to the, the general constructs of programming, things like loops and you know, functions and that kind of thing. Uh, you don't need any kind of a complex tool chain uh, or a build system to use it. So it keeps the uh, amount of boilerplate work that you have to do very low. Um, and you can still work directly with the system if you need to or want to, and you can kind of uh, learn lower level details gradually and develop muscle memory for solving programming problems without having to worry so much about uh, going through a specific set of steps every time you want to test something. So really, the fact that Nuke added Python support was kind of like a perfect storm for me. This was also back right around when Stack Overflow was going kind of into public, uh, a public sphere. So, uh, that's kind of when everybody flocked to there and there was just a whole wealth of information suddenly available. So uh, in 2011, I moved to LA and I started working at Luma as a, <coughs> excuse me, as a junior developer and kind of a Nuke specialist. Uh, they didn't have anyone with a lot of Nuke experience at that point. I think, they were, I think they were fairly recently off the transition from Shake. It was still kind of hanging around, refusing to die for a while, but um, Starting as a developer, I quickly was exposed to a lot of new stuff, anything from large concepts like Linux and version control and uh, Python data, the Python kind of internal data model to more site-specific details like uh, using a relational database to back an entire pipeline or a custom render submission and execution stack. Um, so that was, it, and, and being part of a team really uh, added a, a quick feedback loop for like, 
taking on new information and kind of trying not to overload yourself. I also was exposed to imposter syndrome pretty early on, uh, and that's sort of one of those things that just refuses to die. Um, but over time, my interest kind of got lower and lower level. I kind of went uh, in a, what I call the reverse computer science. Um, I started to get more interested in things like data structure internals, uh, performance of various data structures, that kind of thing. Um, specific types of algorithms, because trees are something that just shows up everywhere in VFX. Uh, more Python internals, uh, evaluation, that kind of thing. And uh, after probably six months, I was actually able to attempt to apply the NDK to solve a production problem uh, by building a sort of intelligent caching system, which didn't end up panning out because, uh, partially due to some technical limitations and partially because it just kind of was a little bit too opaque for users. Um, but I did discover that if you write bad code and then you crash nuke and you crash it inside of a debugger, uh, you can actually learn a lot more about the internals of how Nuke is executing by kind of walking around and examining the smoking remains of the application. <laughs> and in a roundabout way, that's more or less how I ended up here. Uh, so, quick show of hands, how many people are familiar with NDK? All right, so hopefully this won't be boring to everyone. Um, so, in Nuke, images are broken down into rows of pixels. Uh, there are other APIs for interacting with images, but I'm keeping it simple for the sake of time. Uh, originally, I believe this design was due to the fact that Nuke was originally being used uh, in production in the late 90s when machines were a lot less powerful. And so by deciding to break the images up into rows, they were able to process large images without completely blowing up all their hardware. Each row holds separate arrays of pixels for a number of channels, so channels rgba.red, rgba.green, et cetera. Um, and kind of an interesting corollary to the idea of building the processing engine on scan lines is that that's a pattern that is able to be parallelized uh, conceptually fairly easily. I'm not sure if the actual implementation was simple, but um, it, it sort of plays out that way on paper. Uh, so you're all familiar with the node graph. This is what everybody interacts with. Under the hood, uh, Nuke is actually using information from the node graph to build trees of operators, or ops as they're called. Um, and these are what do the actual processing work. Uh, for those of you who are, are familiar with the NDK, I'm aware that this isn't completely accurate, but just you know, bear with me. So <laughs> in Nuke, ops are the plugin API. You can't write nodes. Um, at least not right now. By defining a new op class, you basically are also creating a new node class. Uh, when you create a node, it creates an op, at least one op, and the op is responsible for defining things like which knobs show up on the node, how many inputs the, the node has, whether it's a fixed amount or a dynamic amount, so on, and which types of ops can be connected to, various to the various inputs, so deep ops, 3D ops, 2D ops, so on. Ops can also create their own internal ops if they need to uh, do extra processing that's already f defined by another op class. And this particularly shows up when uh, dealing with things like time. And each op instance uh, only really exists to process data at a specific context or a frame. Basically, a context is defined by a, more or less a frame in a view. So in order to produce an image, Nuke is essentially pull-based, so nothing happens until something actually uh, requests data from a node. So you need basically an, a node that can initiate that procedure. I mean, under the hood, there are other things that can initiate that, like 3D texture previews in the viewer, that kind of thing, can also cause uh, op trees to be cooked. But uh, assuming you're using a basic example, like a write or a viewer, when that processing step starts, Nuke creates trees of operators based on the tree of nodes. And again, there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship between nodes and ops, uh, particularly in the case of an op that needs to uh, operate on multiple frames of input data. What actually happens is that it will create two copies of the tree at different contexts, as opposed to one op that is aware of how to operate on multiple frames. Uh, when the op tree is constructed, Knob values from the nodes basically get 
baked down to the op tree. So things like expressions get evaluated, file sequence strings get resolved, things get converted down to primitive data types. And then there's three kind of core processing phases, excuse me, <coughs> that uh, occur to generate an image. The three phases are called validate, uh, which is where the op declares what its output, where, where each op declares what its output format, bounding box, uh, data window, display window, and channels are. Uh, the next phase is request, which is where an op will request a region of data and, and a set of channels from each of its inputs, potentially multiple inputs. And the third phase is called engine, which is basically where ops produce or process rows of pixel data. So a little deeper dive on uh, validate. Uh, starting from the right, when a render is triggered, the right will ask its input for information about the image it's supposed to write because it has no idea at that point. Grade nodes don't really have an opinion about this because their only purpose is to operate on existing pixel data, so they have to ask their input, so on, all the way up the tree. A read node doesn't have any inputs, but it does have a file path, so it's able to peek at the file header and figure out what size image is going to be produced, and then that format information and channels basically propagates back down the tree. Request is conceptually may seem like a bit of an overlap, but basically, again, the write is gonna request a particular region of the format that the grade told it it had, and then the grade, in turn, will say, okay, in order to satisfy that request, I'm just gonna need the same size box because I don't do anything special. Um, the reason that this is conceptually different than validate is that if you have an, a node like a crop, a crop can have a full-size format, but it can also be reducing the data window of the image at the same time. So it's only gonna need data for a sub, potentially need data for a subset of the image. Um, and similarly, a viewer that's zoomed in is sort of conceptually the same idea. <clears throat> so engine, uh, let's make some image buffers. These are 2K for the sake of argument. Uh, per scan line, the output op, the right in this case, will make a request for a particular row. Again, the grade is not responsible for producing data, so it basically has to make a similar request for that row to the read. Uh, the read obviously can open the file, read pixel data in, return that to the grade. Then based on the knob values, the grade will modify that data, pass it to the right, and so on. And this process, again, can be happening in parallel on multiple threads because each scan line is more or less self-contained. But there are cases where uh, more complex spatial operations are necessary. So imagine a basic three by three box blur where in order to produce one pixel of output, the op actually needs a box of pixels around that output pixel from its input. In other words, it needs multiple scan lines in order to produce one scan line of output. So, uh, in order to facilitate this, Nuke provides what's called a tile API, which basically allows an op to make a request for any arbitrary 2D region of an image. And Nuke will handle basically setting aside cache buffers for that so that if multiple engine threads from one op make overlapping tile requests, those rows don't get recomputed multiple times like in parallel. So in this case, image is read in, the tile request return, is returned to, the, to that particular blur op thread, which then uses that to compute a single row of output, which is then passed back to the right. You can imagine that taking place in parallel with all overlapping tile requests. So quickly wrapping up, um, some highlights since switching over to development at Luma. Uh, we opened a second studio at Melbourne in 2012. Our dev team has grown fairly considerably, uh, is now uh, multi-continental, I guess. Uh, been able to work on lots of other software, work with lots of other open source projects, including USD. Uh, we're, I believe, the first or second studio outside of Pixar to adopt USD. It's been in production for uh, just shy of three years now. Um, and Luma developers have been heavily involved in contributing to the USD project itself. Lastly, for anyone who is either uh, aspiring or fairly new to development, or anybody who's just jaded and needs a refresher. Um, <laughs> some, so just some advice off the top of my head. Uh, admitting what you don't know is one of the most underrated skills, I think, uh, but also being enthusiastic about learning. There's a lot of people out there who can really smell BS from a mile away. 
uh, and it's not a good look. Uh, knowing when something is good enough is another skill that is something that you really only acquire with time, but it's very, very important, particularly in a time-constrained environment like VFX development. Uh, you kind of, again, you just kind of have to develop a feel for this on your own. Um, working with others, again, is extremely important, in particular communication, listening, being able to take uh, critical or constructive feedback in stride and not, not taking it personally. And lastly, learn to love Linux because no one is delivering high-end feature work on anything else. And that's all for me. Thank you all for coming.